Hello, my name is Halska Jarocka and I'm a professor of educational sciences at the Open University of the Netherlands and the chair of the Department on Online Learning and Instruction. Welcome to my keynote entitled Vision for Education – How Eye-Tracking Helps Us to Understand and to Improve Learning and Instruction. Nihil est in intellectu, quod not prius in sensu. Nothing comes into the mind without passing through the senses, stated the philosopher and saint Thomas Aquinas. So, if we want to study the human mind, how it is constituted, but also how it develops through learning, we must understand how we take in information via our senses. As humans, we take most of the information in via our eyes. Vision is the most complex, but also the best, best developed of all of our senses and the best studied sensation. But why is this relevant for education? Since ancient times classrooms were very busy, it was always difficult, both for the teacher and the students, to focus on the essential information, being the learning material or the teacher. Let's have a look at the School of Athens, a painting at the Vatican Museum in Rome, Italy. These two guys in the lower left corner, clearly one is copying the homework of the other. Or the guy above them, he's waving to friends outside of his classroom. And the two next to him, they are probably gossiping about their classmates. Or the guy in the center, who is lying across the stairs probably tired. Or him vividly working on his Sudoku. And these ones, they are contemplating about the upcoming baseball game. And them, they are arguing about the game of tic-tac-toe. All the while the teacher is trying to explain something very important while only one of his students is actually listening. So how can we capture this intake of visual information? We can do so by tracking the eye movements via a specific device called eye tracker. Let's dive into the theoretical and technological foundations of eye tracking. What happens actually when we encounter such a painting? It all begins with the translation of physical energy, light, into psychological sensations, such as seeing a colored dot. This process is called transduction. First, light waves enter the sensory organ, the eye. The eye has receptors, which are called cones and rods, which once activated, lead to neural activity. This neural activity is processed in specific areas of the sensory cortex, resulting in a specific sensation such as color, pattern, texture, motions or depth. But this doesn't mean that we have experienced the beauty of a painting. To do so we need perception. Perceptions are richer, processes of higher order. They involve interpretations and classifications of sensations. Here we see how the light stemming from the painting enters our sensory organ, the eye. First, it enters via the pupil through the lens and is projected at the backdrop of the retina, where it activates the cones and rods. In this way, we can scan the entire painting in order to get a full impression of the painting. But what determines how we scan this painting? There are three influences on our scanning behavior operating at the same time. First, we have top-down influences. These are features of the observer, such as a specific task in mind, expectations about what she sees, or prior knowledge of art, or a lack thereof. Second, systematic tendencies due to features of the eye's physiology. For instance, we tend to look more in the center of a stimulus, or to move our eyes rather in a horizontal than a vertical manner. Third are bottom-up features. These are characteristics of the stimulus itself, meaning the visual saliency of specific elements, such as a bright color, a sharp edge, or a moving element. What follows these eye movements is further cognitive processing of some sort. This can be as shallow as a mere sensation, but can also become a perception or even spark a deep elaboration on a specific topic. 
And this is exactly what we are interested in when we use eye tracking in educational sciences. Eye tracking has, a com has come a long way since its very beginnings. The first studies on eye movements were conducted by the ophthalmologist Luis Emile Javal in the 19th century, and he simply observed people reading. By this simple technique, he already discovered something very crucial that still holds true. Namely, that when we read, our eyes don't smoothly flow along the lines, but make quick jumps instead. These jumps are called saccades and turned out to be the fastest movements our body is capable of. Thus, during those reallocations of our visual attention, we are virtually blind. Otherwise, we would simply get dizzy. But the brief stops in between these jumps are called fixations. And these are the moments we actually take in information and others of utmost interest for the researchers. The next question was how to exactly measure these eye movements. This is where the second photo comes into play. These scleral coils measure exactly the movements of the eyeballs. Here you see a modern version, but in their beginnings these were small cups with a small hole in the center made out of ivory, aluminium, ceramic or rubber placed onto the eyeballs to which a wire was attached that moved along with the eye and thus could draw exactly how an eye moved. Brilliant idea, very accurate. On the downside, to stand such a torture, the eyes had to be anesthetized with cocaine. You know, eye tracking wouldn't be as widely used as it is if it weren't for further development, namely video-based eye tracking. To the right, you see an already well-developed device from the 60s that closely films the eyeballs and infers from what, from that how they move. And basically, this is how modern eye trackers still work up until today. If you want to know more about the history of eye tracking, I highly recommend you the book by Wade and Tetler, The Moving Tablet of the Eye. Let me briefly explain the method of video-based eye tracking. First, an infrared light is directed towards the eye. This light causes a reflection on the cornea. Then, an infrared camera captures this image of the eye. In the next step, an image processing software registers the darkest and the brightest area in the image, which are the pupil and the corneal reflection. When the eye moves, this distance and allocation of these two points changes in relation to each other. Thus, this distance between these two spots in combination with the coordinates of a computer screen reveal the exact location of where a person looked at at the screen. Nowadays, there are different types of eye trackers. The ones most relevant for our type of research are the ones pictured here. Starting in the upper left corner, you see a monitor mounted eye tracker. These are used in most multimedia learning experiments. These eye trackers are attached to the computer screen and thus allow for an unobtrusive recording of participants' eye movements, resulting in natural participant behavior in front of a computer. Below, you see a low-cost and lightweight device. They are the newest trend in the eye tracking community. These are very small eye trackers that can be plugged in into any laptop or tablet via a USB cable making them extremely easy to relocate and allow for ecologically valid situations. On the downside, these eye trackers have quite a low resolution and accuracy and mostly come without analysis software. Albeit not often used in multimedia research yet, these eye trackers could provide information on course processes such as left versus right side of a computer screen while being very cheap. To the right, you see two sorts of eye tracking glasses which allow us to investigate eye movements even outside of computer screens, making them highly ecologically valid and their small size makes them highly mobile. In educational research, they are used to study student-teacher interaction in the classroom or to investigate how learners process information on mobile devices. All of these eye trackers measure the movements of the eyes over time resulting in long lists of X and Y coordinates, which you can see here plotted over time. In a following step, these coordinates are clustered or filtered into different 
eye movement events, namely fixations, saccades and blinks. Then another step follows. The researcher decides which elements of the learning material from form one unit, such as text segment about one topic, and can thus be defined as so-called areas of interest, or AOIs. Then, all earlier detected measures are assigned to specific AOIs. It is important to know that each of these steps is a crucial decision which has an influence on the results. Very many eye-tracking measures exist, and for an exhaustive list I would like to refer you to the book by Holmquist and colleagues, where an entire part of the book is dedicated to listing and explaining their measures. Here I only list the most common ones that are deduced from such eye-tracking recordings. Dwell times are the total viewing times either on an entire stimulus or on a specific area of it. Fixations are moments of relative stillness of the eye which allow for information intake. These events are thus very informative to understand which stimulus elements were processed to which extent. Next, saccades, which relocate the point of attention in an extremely fast way. Hence, we are basically blind during these points in time. Consequently, saccades are rarely being reported in multimedia research. Smooth pursuit, which is a fixation following a moving object. Computationally, it is quite difficult to distinguish between fixations, saccades and smooth pursuit, so commercial software does not provide algorithms to detect it. Consequently, when using dynamic stimuli in multimedia research, such as videos or animations, these either should not have objects moving across longer passages of the screen, or eye-tracking data should be analyzed as unfiltered X and Y coordinates. Furthermore, Scan paths are the total totality of all fixations and saccades on a stimulus. That is, they represent in which order a person inspected a multimedia stimulus. They can be very easily visualized with commercial software in various ways. Blinks, which are not eye movements per se, but are disruptions of data recordings and occur as missing data within the eye tracking data stream. These missing data, however, have such a specific characteristics in terms of frequency and duration that they can be clearly classified as blinks. The pupil dilation is not a movement of the eyeball, but rather a movement within the eye, the contraction of the iris. When looking into which measures are really used in the educational sciences, we find that these are the most often used ones, with fixations being the most prominent ones. But what do these measures mean? The ones highlighted in red give insight into general intake of information. The green ones about temporal aspects of information intake. And the blue ones about the amount of processing load. So what can we actually learn from these eye tracking measures for educational, educational science? We can understand how processing information is related to actual learning. This is mainly done from two perspectives. First, from the perspective of the learning material, such as it, its instructional design or the guidance of learners' attention across it. Second, coming from the perspective of the learner, where we can study his or her processing load, strategy use and the effects of his or her prior knowledge or expertise. In today's keynote, I will focus on two examples from this list. The first line of research I would like to introduce you to is the one of optimizing instructional design, in particular the use of multimedia for learning and for testing, and how eye tracking helps us to understand and to improve this. Undoubtedly, all of you are familiar with the cognitive theory of multimedia learning, which details how we process multimedia information when learning from it. If we take a close look at this theory, we see that it makes statements about searching, organizing and integrating of information elements. 
all of which are processes which can be potentially captured with eye tracking. Indeed, recommendations on how to design multimedia learning material based on the cognitive theory of multimedia learning were picked up early on in eye tracking research on educational science. Probably the best known is that multimedia material should be presented in an integrated manner. Here you see an example from a research group at Lund University in Sweden, which asked participants to read a newspaper. Different participant groups received different formats of the multimedia material, of which the second one was designed based on the recommendations of the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. This and other research on this topic showed that under more experimental conditions, people focus on the main text in a separated format, while under more naturalistic, leisure conditions, they mostly focus on pictures. When information is presented in an integrated format, however, all information seems to be processed. A lot of research has been conducted on this topic since then. And I would like to refer you to these four articles to dive more into the specifics of this broad research field. Today, I would like to invite you to think along a different line with me. Does the cognitive theory of multimedia learning and its resulting design guidelines also apply when we are not talking about taking in new information, but about recalling and applying existing knowledge, such as in testing situations. As you may already know, computer-based testing is on the rise, and this development skyrocketed due to the corona pandemic, where we were forced to move to online and digital testing, the problem is, while practitioners are implementing computer-based testing massively now, we actually don't really know how to do it. On the one hand, computer-based testing can be truly valid by being authentic and motiva motivating. On the other hand, computer-based testing can be really distracting and overwhelming for the testees and thus falsify the test results, making them unreliable. I would like to present you first research on this rather still novel topic. The most famous design guideline for learning with multimedia is the multimedia principle stating that humans learn best from words and pictures than just words alone. Together with colleagues from Lund University in Sweden, we wanted to see whether this also holds true for testing. We presented students with authentic exams on vector calculus in two versions, one with text alone and another one accompanied by a graph representing the formula provided in the text. Students had to verify or falsify a statement that was made about this formula. We found no multimedia effect, but a tendency to confirm statements accompanied by pictures. Eye tracking data showed in the multimedia condition less attention to the text and the question and more attention to the picture of course. But the attention, the amount of attention to the picture did not result in better performance. Attention to the question resulted in better performance and integration of the question and the picture also resulted in better performance. In sum, we found that pictures in testing are only beneficial if they are integrated actively with a text and used critically, otherwise pictures can distract and lead to bias. The group of Marlit Lindner also published a lot on this topic and I would like, ha like to highlight one of their studies. Lindner and colleagues specified this our finding even further. They studied how the presence of texts and pictures during learning interacts with the presence in testing. They found that pictures were only beneficial if pictures were present in both instances. In line with our findings, pictures boosted students' confidence 
even if performance was not actually improved, thereby underlying the risk of picture-induced metacognitive bias. In another study, we investigated the applicability of the contiguity principle to testing. This principle states that it's better to present related information in an integrated manner than in a split fashion. Yet again, we presented students with authentic exams in two versions, of which one provided information in an integrated manner and the other one in a split fashion. We actually found that students performed better in the split than in the integrated format. Eye tracking revealed that in an integrated format, students inspected all information, while in the split format, they neglected a lot of the additional information. A further analysis of the content of these test items revealed that the content of the additional info and the aim of the test is key. So only if integration is helpful, performance can also increase. Sass and colleagues also studied the contiguity principle in testing. Their results showed that students achieved higher test scores for test items in an integrated format. However, this was only true for diagrams, but not for representational or organizational pictures. Confirming our results, their eye-tracking data showed that students paid more attention to pictorial information when the test items were designed in an integrated manner. In our latest publication, we decided to apply several multimedia design guidelines at once to improve the processing of the multimedia provided in authentic school exams. We compared thus the original format as provided by the publisher with a format adapted according to several principles of the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Results showed that applying these design guidelines decreased the difficulty of the test items. That is, students scored significantly higher on these adapted test items. Moreover, eye tracking data showed that the adapted items required less visual search and increased attention to the question and answer elements of the test items. Finally, cognitive load decreased in the adapted items compared to the original ones. These results indicate that applying multimedia principles to computer-based testing can be beneficial and it seems to prevent cognitive overload and help students to focus on important parts of the test items, leading to better test results. So what can we conclude on the use of multimedia in testing? In terms of performance, multimedia can lead to better performance if pictures are representative and mandatory, if the overall layout of the items is according to multimedia guidelines. But pictures can also evoke a bias in students. In terms of visual processing, the layout of test items influences their visual processing. Integrated item formats ensure that students attend to all item elements. Pictures attract visual attention at cost of less attention to test and question, which does not result in better performance per se. Test items adapted according to multimedia guidelines result in less distraction of pictures. I am now moving forward to the second line of research where eye tracking is widely used in educational sciences. This time we look into the perspective of the learner, probably into the most important learner characteristic. Expertise is defined as a consistently superior performance on a specified set of representative tasks for a domain, according to Ericsson. But what causes this superiority? So far, we have looked into initial learning. With increasing expertise, information processing is fundamentally different. For novices, information processing is restricted by temporal and spatial limitations of working memory. The more a person knows about a task or a domain, the more we must take the long-term memory into account as well. In the long-term memory, all knowledge is stored and with increasing experience in a task, it is reorganized. This knowledge organization, in turn, 
changes the deal for the working memory. It changes it to this extent that Erickson and Kinch suggested the concept of long-term working memory. For instance, with increasing numerical skills, children do not have to memorize six digits separately, but can form two chunks of three digits each and thus increase their working memory capacity. With ongoing mathematical education, children can even solve mathematical problems described in text form. They quickly see the crucial cues that indicate which type of formula should be used. Based on this info, they know which other information they have to search for in the text and which they can ignore to fill in the formula. Next, they solve the formula and formulate a solution to the problem. This procedure describes an exemplary use of a schema. If a schema includes a specific temporal order, such as visiting a restaurant, that is enter a restaurant, look for a table, order from menu, it is called a script. Another form of knowledge organization is forming shortcuts within long chains of reasoning by encapsulating parts of it into entities that are only unfolded into its pieces if necessary. All these concepts describe not only efficient ways to store information in long-term memory, but also how this expands working memory. One entire schema functions as only one entity, thus plenty capacity is left over to collect new information to fill in the schema's empty slots. These efficient ways of organizing knowledge in turn strongly guide search and intake of information. This guided processing of visual information is referred to as visual expertise or professional vision. The concept of visual expertise or professional vision assumes a constant interplay of cognition and perception. For diverse professions, we already know a lot about this interplay. For instance, visual expertise have been extensively studied in radiology and in chess. Here you see a classical study of Rheingold and colleagues where they show how cognitive chunking is reflected in the eye movements of chess players with increasing expertise. As already stated, most research on this topic has been conducted on the field of chess and radiology. And this is also where you can find the most reviews or even meta-analysis on. Recently, a new domain is receiving increasing attention, namely teaching. I will talk more on this in a minute, but I would like to already refer you to a recent special issue by Irene Skubala, Hans Gruber and myself on this, as can be seen in the right corner below. And now I would like to introduce you to three projects from our own team on three different expertise domains. The first study is on air traffic control. People working as air traffic controllers have to constantly monitor radar screens, which can be seen in the upper right corner. Their task is to chunk planes into groups, decide on the order in which these chunks may enter the airport, and finally steer these planes into the landing positions. They have to do so in a safe, efficient and environmentally aware way. We compared how air traffic control students, beginning air traffic controllers and experienced air traffic controllers executed this task while we eye-tracked them. Results showed that with increasing expertise, participants came up with better solutions in quicker time and the solutions became more similar. The amount of mental effort experienced while performing this task was not, not linear though, while beginning air traffic controllers experienced quite high levels of mental effort, experienced air traffic controllers and students experienced low levels of mental effort. Moreover, we found that these three groups applied different visual strategies. First, with higher level of expertise, air traffic controllers displayed more holistic processing of their radar screens 
as indicated by looking quicker to relevant areas and transitioning less between different elements. Experts' visual processing was also more efficient in that they looked longer on relevant areas than students. Interestingly, beginners were sometimes even less efficient than students in their visual processing. Finally, with increasing expertise, individuals displayed more sophisticated task-specific approaches to this task. This interesting line of research is currently pursued further by our PhD candidate, Eric Sacrison. A second domain that I would like to introduce you to is digital pathology, which Thomas Jasma studied in his PhD project. He investigated how clinical pathologists, pathology res residents and medical students diagnose digitalized colon tissue. In doing so, he made use of a diverse range of data, namely diagnostic performance, zooming and panning movement in the digital colon, slides, think aloud protocols and eye tracking data. As a result of his project, he found that experts use more holistic processing as they spend more time on an overview of the slide and only zoom in on very specific locations. Also, with higher expertise, individuals were able to provide correct diagnosis on very brief displays of the colon tissue. Interestingly, although experts and intermediate pathologists did not differ in the diagnostic performance, they did so in individual processing of the colon tissue. While experts very quickly looked into the very relevant areas and spent the remaining time looking for potential other pathological abnormalities, intermediates had to use all of the time on rechecking diagnostic relevant areas and they could have thus missed other abnormalities. Furthermore, pathologists with higher expertise had a more efficient approach to diagnosis through encapsulations and chunking in their verbalizations, but also by inspecting fewer diagnostically relevant areas visually. Finally, Thomas found indications for task-specific behavior in that experts and intermediates show a clear orientation phase, intermediates also display a control phase at the end of the diagnostic process, while novices show no uniform process at all. The last domain I would like to present to you is that of teacher's classroom management. A central aspect of effective classroom management is teacher's withitness, the ability to maintain an ongoing awareness of what is happening in the classroom and the events taking place within it. It requires knowledge grounded in an understanding of the complexity of classroom events and what they mean for teaching and learning. Teaching expertise strongly influences perceiving, representing and interpreting classroom events and how well equipped a teacher is to manage classrooms. Charlotte Wolf and Nick van den Bogert have both compared beginning and experienced teachers who are watching videos of different classroom videos. Participants were asked to think aloud, to signal when they saw an event relevant for classroom management, all while their eye movements were tracked. Over the course of their both PhD projects, they found that novices describe classroom events in a more descriptive manner and focus on the current ongoing events and on problematic behavior, while experts focus more on students' learning and consider implications for future events. In terms of visual processing, they found that novices often don't even notice relevant events and that they are visual attention is scattered and focused mainly on saliency, while experts focus more on relevant areas and they monitor all students evenly. This area of research is growing and moving more and more towards real-world classrooms with teachers wearing eye-tracking glasses while teaching their own classes. Charisse van Driel conducts her PhD project on exactly this topic. Moreover, two special issues were recently published on this topic, one by Andreas Lachner, Matthias Nückles and myself in Instructional Science, and another one by Irene Skubala, Hans Gruber and myself in Educational Psychology Review. 
So what do we know by now on visual expertise? We know that it is composed of, of a perceptual and a more cognitive component and that it requires the noticing of specific events or elements and their appropriate interpretation. We also know the visual, that visual expertise results in increased situational awareness of the surrounding, referred to as withedness in teaching. We also have seen repeatedly that visual expertise enables a quick holistic processing of an image, which is then followed by an efficient foveal search. This in turn results in a more efficient processing of the image or the surrounding. Another issue that has come up repeatedly is that visual expertise is highly domain and even task specific. That means that experts in a specific task or domain display very specific strategies that are not applicable to even slightly varied tasks. That means that also the accompanying eye tracking measures differ very much between tasks and domains. For instance, resulting sometimes in experts having longer and sometimes shorter fixations than novices. What we also see is that visual expertise develops gradually and under certain circumstances and for certain aspects non-linearly. On a last note, it is important to mention that the ultimate aim of expertise research is to get insight into its training. I cannot go in depth, but I just want to briefly mention that different options have been studied, such as the apprenticeship approach, direct instruction, eye movement modeling examples, and the effect of reflective and offloading pauses during training. We have to be careful though that teaching perceptual aspects of visual expertise alone is often not sufficient as visual expertise also always requires the cognitive component. Having shown all the potential that eye tracking has, I want to now focus briefly on its most important challenges, being of methodological, ethical and legal nature. Let us begin with three methodological challenges. First of all, we want to set up an appropriate eye tracking experiment without creating any biases or artifact in the data. We have to keep in mind that eye tracking data are really vulnerable to the visual setup of a stimulus, such as the lightning of the screen, the placement of the targets, their saliency, etc. Second is the issue of carefully operating hard and software to ensure reliable and valid data. An inexperienced or careless experimenter can mess up an entire data set, for instance by not caring enough for the calibration or not observing the quality of the eye detection throughout the entire recording session. These issues might be very difficult to detect afterwards. Third, we must be prepared to analyze large amounts of messy data and not to fall trip for statistical errors. Any sort of inappropriate post-processing, being on the level of event detection, defining appropriate AIs, can bias entire findings. So if you don't have any experience with eye tracking yet, but want to start off with it, I would like to recommend you these two books on eye tracking methodology. Next, we face conceptual challenges. When interpreting the findings you obtain with eye tracking data, you need to remember that eye trackers measure different eye movements. Full stop. That's it. You really need to be cautious with any broader interpretations. However, if you want to draw any further meaningful conclusions and not just sticking to reporting plane measures, you need to take precautions. For instance, what is often done is a methodological triangulation of eye tracking data with other sorts of data such as verbal reports, performance data, logging data, etc. Also, you need to make sure to embed your findings and the interpretations thoroughly into existing theories. Finally, you should have a close look into already existing research and well-established research paradigms. They can give you good hints 
on how to proceed with interpreting your data. One book that I would like to recommend you as a starting point is the Oxford Handbook of Eye Movements. And finally, when using eye tracking data, we face important legal and ethical issues, the most important being the General Data Protection Regulation. This law is relevant when processing any sort of personal data. Personal data is any information that can be traced back to a specific person directly or indirectly, by your name, but also IP address or location. Given that research has shown that eye movements are idiosyncratic, meaning that they can be traced back to a specific person, we can clearly see that eye tracking data fall under this regulation. A specific issue concerns biometric data, which are data resulting from specific processing related to phys physical, physiological or behavioral characteristics of a natural person, which allow to identify directly or indirectly this person. As these are sensitive personal data, which are even more on the protection of this law. Be aware that specific high-resolution eye trackers record and even store the recordings of the eye, including the iris, which then would fall under this regulation. Finally, photographs and videos fall obviously under this category. This can, is an issue for any sort of mobile eye tracking data where the stimulus is anything in the outer world. Hence, anyone that your participant is looking at should give written permission to be recorded. Per definition by this law, recording, collecting, storing, analyzing and reporting data falls under this regulation. Hence, to be able to process it, we need written consent of each and every individual being recorded. This is not a problem if you record one person at a time in a laboratory. But ecologically valid research with mobile eye tracking, such as the research on classroom management that I presented to you earlier, seriously suffers under this regulation. As many colleagues have confirmed, it is almost impossible to obtain written consent of all students and their parents to obtain the recording of only one teacher. The situation becomes even more difficult if you try to record mobile eye tracking data on our street. It is almost not feasible to conduct such research anymore. Another issue is the notion of open science and data sharing. Knowing that Every eye-tracking data are idiosyncratic and that must be considered personal data. Can we really provide open access to this data source? In particular, knowing the increasing strength of algorithms used by big tech companies? To my knowledge, these are still unsolved and often unfortunately underestimated open issues. So, where can we go from here and what is the future of eye-tracking research? I would like to present you several topics that I personally deem interesting to exploring further. We can use eye tracking as a research tool to study several topics. First, we can investigate pre-assumptions of information processing and learning theories with eye tracking. Consider, for instance, the cognitive theory of multimedia learning, which makes clear statements on searching and organizing information, which can easily be translated into eye tracking measures. Second, we can study the concrete effects of different instructional guidelines on how learners but also experts process learning material. The research I presented to you today falls under these two categories. But there's also other research worthwhile pursuing. We can also investigate more complex processes relevant to learning, such as self-regulated learning processes, as for instance done by Michelle Nüchteren in her PhD thesis, metacognition, emotion, mental effort, as for instance is done by Joy Lee or Adam Shulevsky, and searching information on the internet to learn is as conducted by Ivan Kamara. Moreover, we can use eye tracking also directly as a tool for learning. This is best known under the term eye movement modeling examples and Tamara van Gogh gave in 2017 a keynote at the early on this very topic. Another very interesting way to use eye tracking directly is case-based interaction, where actions on the computer can take place based on looking at a specific location on the screen, such as activating a link. Yet another very interesting topic is to use eye tracking in the wild of educational practice. We can do so in various ways. Recent developments in smartphone webcam-based eye tracking allow us to track mobile and online learning. 
Another trend is the setup of experimental classrooms with eye trackers, such as the Humanities Lab in Lund, the DigiLab at the Knowledge Media Research Center, another one at the University Regensburg. This allows us to study different instructional effects in a more naturalistic but still controlled setting. First studies have shown the effects of social presence on eye tracking measures. Finally, some research suggests that not only researchers, but also people naive to eye tracking can draw meaningful conclusions based on eye movements of people inspecting a stimulus. But, and this may pave way to teachers being able to use eye trackers in schools for diagnostic purposes. But is this really feasible? Let's begin with the notion that eye tracking is becoming integrated into our commercial technology world now. For instance, several big tech companies provide nowadays apps to couple their services with eye tracking. Even the Microsoft support website explains in detail on how to integrate eye tracking into operating windows. Apple has just announced eye tracking support for their iPad. You can even order a cheap eye tracker on Amazon and get it delivered by tomorrow. So eye tracking is indeed entering our everyday lives. I would like to end with showing you recent examples of how people outside of research are really using eye tracking. Here you see the German social media sensation Rezo using eye tracking just for a fun video. Here you see a programmer teaching debugging while displaying his gaze with the help of an eye tracker. And most relevant, here you see a first pioneering project by Dr. Matthias Böhm at a South school in South Germany where he uses eye tracking successfully to diagnose and foster school children's reading skills. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm eager to hear your questions now. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the compliments. And the question is, um, which features of eye tracking to use when capturing learning processes? Um, and this is actually a really uh, complex question and not easy to answer. And the reason is, um, is that there are really a ton of eye tracking measures and these are highly task and domain specific. And they will also very much uh, depend on the stimulus material you use. Um, and there are few really um, uh, measures where we really show what they mean. A lot of them are stem from uh, reading research. So if you have a lot of text, you, they are actually very clear um, measures such as fixation durations uh, and in, in which range they should be in order to have someone, a skilled reader, uh, or how often they should go back to specific words. That will help you a lot. We don't have uh, such clear definitions for other more complex learning materials such as multimedia material as of yet. Um, but I would re definitely recommend you to have a look at uh, existing eye tracking papers on this field and to very importantly stick very close to your theory and hypothesis that you have and try to operationalize them in, uh, into specific measures. Just to check, is Erno Lettinen already here? Okay, I don't think so. Well, then uh, please go ahead, just put your questions either in the chat or uh, maybe you can also raise your hand or um, just pop your question. Yes, Charlene. Okay. Yes, uh, I was actually typing my question just now, but I think it's nicer to say something to a person <laughs> than typing it. So um, yes, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. It was really also very nice to follow. Um, and um, my question would be, how reliable do you think um, are webcam-based eye tracking tools as um, compared to those tools that are more regularly used? And um, specifically, when you think of using these webcam-based tools in a classroom study um, instead of um, um, a lab study? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, Erno, just for your information, we already started off. I hope you don't mind. 
No, 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 it's, it was fine. I, I had some technical problems to change from the video to, to the discussion. But, but uh, uh, before you answer, I, I just uh, want to thank you very much for your presentation. And, and also, I'm very happy that there's so big audience following that. And now we can go to the first question already. OK, bye. Thank you. Um, well, um, Shalini, you asked about the uh, quality of webcam-based eye tracking. We actually had a very interesting session exactly on this topic yesterday. Um, that was a SIG 27 invited symposium and Ellen Koch has given a presentation on that and she focused on the Gorilla software. Uh, there are other softwares. There's also a software by uh, a commercial provider, Toby Sticky. I've been also looking into that. Um, the point is that the, as of right now, the quality is not very good. And this became very clear during this, uh, this presentation. Um, and because you, you don't simply don't know what, what participants are really doing at home. So if you're not in a classroom, if you're, if you're doing it really online, it's very difficult to, to control the setting at all. But we, all, we know that from, from um, online research always. And the other thing is that we don't have no control about the quality of the webcam. Um, what we agreed upon is what is definitely doable is to do something with very large AIs, with quadrants of the screen, for instance, or simply checking the participants look at the screen at all, or are they engaging something else? That is also a nice and interesting check. And we also all agreed, I guess, on the, the ensuing discussion that uh, technology is right now so rapidly um, evolving that we are all pretty sure that this will improve quickly and fast. And if you've seen uh, the last part of my presentation, um, uh, the, um, all the big tech companies are really implementing eye tracking right now. So there will be an eye, eye tracking support for the iPad and Apple, Windows, and Windows you can uh, use eye tracking. So we, we can really count on a fast development on that. Right now, as far as is it right now, I would say you can use it for course measures. So do the look at the screen, which area of the screen. And if you position, for instance, your text and your picture and your learning material in such a way, that should be uh, really, uh, really something. OK, so thank you. And uh, further questions? And I just comment shortly that this, this development that uh, eye tracking is not anymore uh, only used for research purposes, but it's, uh, there are so many, many fields and also commercial fields which are now uh, actively using the uh, uh, new technologies. It's, it might cause also some problems for the reliability of the analysis tools and, and so on, but, but this is a complex problem, I think. Okay, further questions? Uh, maybe I should set, uh, um, pick up some of the ones in the chat because I saw, for instance, the next one was by Lucia about uh, eye movements and emotions. Um, so what we definitely know from in terms of eye movements and emotions is that pupil dilation is sensitive to the emotional state. And this is something that's probably most uh, straightforward to use. Uh, it's a, an additional eye movement measure that is always within the eye tracking recording. Not for web-based eye tracking, though I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So only with, uh, um, yeah, Alan also says it's not the case. So it's only for the for the uh, research eye trackers. Um, the only thing with pupil dilation is that you we need to keep in mind is that it, the the most strongest influence on pupil dilation is light. So it's very important to keep a stable light source. But if the if the material does not vary strongly with light, this should be uh, an interesting uh, avenue to go to. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. And then the, in the chat, there was also a question from Sana Järvela about the opportunities to combine this kind of multimodal uh, um, eye tracking as, as one uh, measurement tool in multimodal research. Can you comment about that? Yeah, yeah. I have been, of course, also following exactly this symposia of, of Sana and, and, and Inge and, and Roger Acevedo. Uh, I have I, I agree. I think that there is a huge potential, and in particular, going back to this webcam-based eye tracking, I think this would be something if we move away from this uh, highly um, lab-based eye trackers that are really huge tower-mounted eye trackers that restrict participants, and then that they are extremely artificial and they are wired uh, in several senses, then this is not a route I would go down to. But if you look more into the, the more recent developments and it doesn't need to be webcam-based eye tracking. It can be also like these 
uh, small plug-in eye trackers that you can simply plug in into a, a tablet or a, a laptop mm -hmm. or the glasses. Uh, I think this is really a, a, a huge possibility and it would enrich uh, the, the existing multimodal data, I think a lot, because it gives unique insight into what information is exactly processed. And often the other measures, for instance, give information about emotional states or engagement. And if you combine this, this would be that this could really um, contribute really very um, uh, really good addition to the existing data source and give really new insights. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes, that's for sure. Interesting question. Uh, there's an, uh, a question which is very personal. <laughs> so that how did you uh, 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 start uh, doing research in, in this field? I, I think that's that would be interesting for the audience to hear. Yeah. Uh, so I started immediately right at my, um, when I started off my PhD. Uh, we had a, just recently purchased an eye tracking device that was at the Knowledge Media Research Center in Tübingen. And there was one other PhD student working on it, but she quickly left and it was also a very different field. Um, and this was, um, this was a difficult start because it was in the very beginning, it was really very lonely and I, I completely underestimated it, the complexity of it. Uh, luckily, uh, throughout the course of my PhD, other PhDs also started doing it. And uh, we had one huge um, important uh, opportunity is during the beginning of my PhD, the KMRC invited uh, Kenneth Holmquist uh, for, for a research stay at our institute. And he was there for a couple of weeks to write his book. And uh, this was, of course, a unique opportunity. And, and thanks to him, I could really dive into uh, eye tracking, the methodology to understand it, this complexity. And we started our cooperation right. since then. And, and he really helped me to hone my uh, expertise and experience in eye tracking. Mm -hmm. So uh, Marcus Nibala is asking, uh, uh, do you have examples of this? Uh, uh, non-linear development of uh, expertise. Uh, uh, this is quite a complex theoretical question. I, yeah. I, if you, yes. So we know this. Uh, we know that this exists from already from verbal data. A lot of work of uh, Alt Spossheisen, of course, surrounds uh, surrounds about that. Um, and this is actually a phenomenon we are. So for for for, for uh, those who are not familiar with expertise research, the idea is that uh, beginners are simply. Yeah, they don't know really what to do, so they are all over the place. Then in an intermediate stage level, you gain expertise and you become, you know, get, gain knowledge and an experience in the task. And then with uh, higher levels of expertise, you become very efficient. But this, um, this gaining more knowledge and more experience sometimes leads to a situation where, where it becomes really more, far more complex. And then all of a sudden, people in this stage due to the fact they know so much that it's very difficult for them to operate in an efficient way. And all of a sudden they are slower uh, than, than the novices, maybe the, uh, beginners, they, are, they perform maybe in the worst because they get lost in these networks of knowledge. And we know that from verbal data quite, quite well in medicine. Um, what we found here is we found that also in, um, in, uh, medical, in the medical domain, uh, but also a little bit in the, um, in the domain of air traffic control. Um, but the idea that this exists also in a perceptual um, aspect of, of expertise is already quite old. Actually, Lescott and colleagues in 1988 wrote about that already. They, they ex explicitly stated this without having yet a lot of, of uh, data on that because eye tracking wasn't as far back then, that this is nonlinear uh, development of expertise. Good. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, basically, our time is over, but uh, still one question. If somebody wants to ask it by video, that would be nice. Okay, maybe we are happy. And thank you very much, uh, this, as, as somebody commented, this would be a, a mandatory introduction for everybody who who is interested about this topic. So you have, your presentation was so rich important basic information and and very interesting uh, uh, kind of views for uh, future as well thank you very much thank you also for everybody 
uh, following this session. Thank you. Bye-bye.